Masking is something you can do in just about any video editor and the concepts in this video will be largely transferable regardless of where you do your editing. I'll be demonstrating these concepts and techniques in DaVinci Resolve 17, but by the end of the video, you should become more comfortable and confident with masks across the board. If you do want to pick up Resolve though, it's free and I'll have a link to the product page in the description, along with a video walkthrough of installing it if you want or need a little extra help. Now then, let's get into part one. What are we talking about? We're talking about masking video, which is a bit different than masking your face because instead of adding a layer that hides or obscures something, we're cutting a hole in something, sort of like making art with tissue paper. When you add a mask, it allows you to see what's underneath your masked area. It's not a hard fast rule, but we'll cover that in more detail later in the video. Masking is incredibly useful in all areas of video editing from compositing and keying to color grading and VFX. Having a comfortable handle on masking will get you a lot of the way to most things you've seen that you think are cool. Even if it maybe isn't exactly the way whatever shot you just thought of was made, you can probably get at least 75% of the way there with masks and elbow grease. Let's stop talking about masks and get into part two. Let's get started. This is the Fusion page inside of Resolve. If you're using a different program or if you just switched to Resolve from a different program, nice job, welcome to the club, this might look weird to you. These are nodes, and they effectively function as layers, but instead of stacking on top of each other, these flow from left to right. By default, they'll be arranged horizontally, and once you get used to using nodes, you will probably love them. Even Sam Kohler's in on it now. I fully switched over to DaVinci Resolve. The list of reasons as to why I think it's the best is very long, but the main ones are node-based color grading, node-based compositing, and also just reliability. It's definitely the most reliable software I've ever used. Haven't had any issues with it. And at the end of the day, I think that that's the most important thing for me as an editor. The first thing we're gonna do in here to make this easier to look at and easier to follow is right-click somewhere in this grid, but not on a node. Then we'll click force all tile pictures and these will become easier to see. Now we're ready to add our first mask node. There are a couple ways to do this in Fusion and the way I recommend getting used to is hotkeys. It'll make you much faster and more efficient with your editing in the long run, but if you struggle to remember them in the beginning, you can find most of what we'll be using today in the masking section of this hotbar. The hotkey to find any tool you need is shift space. Once this Find Tool menu comes up, you can type in the name of the tool you need, select it, then press Add to get it into your node web. That's my favorite way, but if you're into file hierarchies, you can come up to your effects panel, drop down Tools, find Mask, and get your full list in there as well. Those you just click and drag out into your nodes panel, and they're ready to use. However you choose to add your mask node, let's start with a rectangle to learn the absolute basics. Depending on whether or not you had a node selected, that might be connected and do something right away, or it might just be floating in free space like this. If you add it and it's connected to a node and you'd rather it wasn't, go ahead and click the second half of this blue line to disconnect it. For this though, we'll need it to be connected to our media in. To do that, we'll grab our rectangle's output and drag it into the mask input, the blue triangle, on our media in number one. When we do that, we'll see a pretty extreme change in our viewer up here. If our mask node is selected, we'll see these green lines as outlines for the area it's affecting. Now that we've added our rectangle and it's in our node web, let's start playing with some of the properties so we can get acquainted with our options. If your inspector panel isn't open, just click this inspector button up here and it'll pop up. We'll want to verify that we're looking at the properties for rectangle 1, and if we aren't, go ahead and click it out here and it should then be represented in the inspector. Let's start from the top here so we can start figuring out part 3 the properties of a mask. Our first one here is the level property. This determines how much our mask influences the clip or effect that it's on. You can pretty much look at this parameter as a percentage, with 1 being 100% and 0 being 0%. If you drag your slider down and watch your viewing window, you'll see exactly what this does. If you want more precise control over how fast this slides, just, you know, hold control while you drag it. So from 100% to 0%, we can see that the effects of the mask are completely removed once we get to zero. This parameter is also keyframeable, which means you can click this diamond here to lock your level to its current value at this moment in your footage. If you want that to change over time, we can move forward or backward in our clip, then bring this to a new level, and it will automatically transition from our first keyframe to our next keyframe. 
That's super useful for all sorts of reasons, but I find I most commonly use it if I only need the mask for certain parts of a clip. So I'll set a keyframe at zero, then move only one frame forward and set it to one. That turns the mask on instantly with no fade. Next up, we have our filter, and if we change this, it looks like nothing happens. That's because this one works in conjunction with the next property, Soft Edge. If we bring our Soft Edge up, we introduce this fade effect which reduces the harshness of our mask. With Soft Edge turned up a bit, we can now see what filter does. If we switch from Fast Gaussian to Box, you'll see that the blur changes a bit. Most of the time, Fast Gaussian is fine, but if you're really into alternative blurring methods, this one's for you. Moving on down, we have Border Width. This serves as an expansion or retraction slider to change how much of something your mask is working on without actually changing the geometry of the mask itself. Now we have Invert and Solid. Invert is probably my most used parameter in here for masks. When you check this box, your mask goes from exclusively showing a region to excluding that region. This is super helpful if you need something to not be in the clip or if you need to cut a hole in an effect. Solid is kind of funky and technical, but when it's disabled, it turns the mask into just an outline, which you can adjust the thickness of with your border width slider, like this. Moving beyond our little divider over here, we get to center X and Y. These adjust the position of your mask. X moves it horizontally and Y moves it vertically. So if we drag this to the right, our mask will move to the right. And if we drag it to the left, it'll move left. Same idea over here. Up moves it up and down moves it down. You can also affect this from inside the viewing window by grabbing these arrows and dragging them around, or grabbing this central box which will allow you to move it freely. Then we have width, which changes the width, and height, which changes the height. Crazy stuff. Under that, we have corner radius, which will round out our corners if we increase the value. Then we have angle, which allows us to rotate our mask around its center. Those are all of the basic parameters of a mask, and now that we have an understanding of those, we can start part four, some creative effects with masks. The goal of this section of the video is to get your creative juices flowing and get you thinking about masks in a slightly different way. We're gonna be making some animated glowing light effects using a color, a glow, and masks. So first, we're gonna to need to add a background node and again, shift space to find your tool. We also need to grab a soft glow node, a merge node, and we're gonna be using mask paint to get this done. Connect your mask paint output to your background one's mask input, then connect your background one output to your soft glow input, the yellow arrow. Now we'll get rid of our rectangle from earlier by clicking it and pressing backspace. Then we'll drag our merge node onto this line while holding shift and once it turns yellow and blue, go ahead and drop it in there. If that didn't work for you, you just cut the line and attach media in one's output to the yellow input on the merge, then the merges output into the yellow input on the media out. Once you have that in the middle there, go ahead and bring your soft glow output into the green input on your merge node. Nothing will appear to change yet, so as long as your node web looks something like this, you're on track. We'll start at the beginning of our timeline here and select our mask paint node. Now, in our viewing window, we'll see all of these controls show up. In order to not make this part way too complex, we're just gonna make sure that multi-stroke is selected. I'll find where an action starts because this effect looks best when used in conjunction with an action. So right here where the syringe goes into the vial looks like it'll be good for this. We're gonna basically be doing a stop motion animation to make some Star Wars OT blaster shots come out of this vial. Before we start creating the animation for this, we wanna pick a color for our background. So click background and then over here in your inspector panel, go ahead and choose your color. On our first frame, we're just gonna make some dots. The brush looks a little big right now, so we'll adjust our brush size in our inspector panel under brush controls. Let's say 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.02. Much better. Okay, I'm gonna add these dots around the vial, then hover my cursor over one of them, and using my right arrow key, move forward one frame. The dots will go away, but if we left arrow key to go back a frame, we'll see them there. Right arrow key, and right where that dot was, will make a little line. We'll do this for each one of our dots. Then we'll do a very similar move, but we'll start from inside the line or at the end of the line, depending on how smooth we want the animation to look. So back and forth, I'll extend out each line. You probably see what we're doing here at this point, so I'm gonna complete this burst by making the line shorter each time until they disappear. 
Now, if we watch this back, we can watch those lines move as the video plays. That technique can be used for tons of different things and can be a really fun thing to add to your videos. Now I'm going to show you a few more cool things you can do with masks in part 5. Masks for color grading. We'll move from the fusion page over to the color page to do some simple color grading work with our masks. In this hotbar here, you'll find this ellipse. Click it to get into the power window tab. Masks are called power windows here because on this page they can do some other very cool things but we'll be using them exclusively as masks. What we're gonna do in here is turn these trays from their powder blue color to more of a pink color without changing the top of this box, the label on this bottle, or whatever this thing is. So in the Power Windows tab, I'll select the pen tool and add some points around these trays. Obviously, you don't have this clip, but you can use this technique in almost any clip to a similar effect. Once you've drawn your mask around whatever it is you want to change, we're going to move into our qualifier tab, which is indicated by this dropper icon right here. On this tab, if we bring our cursor back into our viewing window, it will now look like a dropper. We'll use this to pick which color we want to change. Once you've clicked something, all of these bars will become populated with stuff. In order to see what you've selected, press Shift H on your keyboard. That'll give you this view where you can really dial in your selection with these bars down here. Flicking back and forth here, it looks like I'm missing a lot of the darker blue areas, so I'll use my luminance controls to cover more of that darker shade. I'm going to be able to bring that all the way down since there isn't really anything else blue inside this mask, and we can see that more of our trays are selected. I'm also going to be covering a wider range of saturation, and use this width control for the hue bar to cover more blues. That looks pretty good, so I'll add just a slight touch of blur around the edges with this slider right here. I'm happy with our selection, so I'll press Shift H again to get everything else back in our viewer. It doesn't look like we've done anything yet, but if we go to our color wheels tab right here, we can start making some changes and they'll only affect our trays. So with our color wheels up, we'll go ahead and change our hue using this hue control right here. Our trays are changing color right before our very eyes while all of the other blue things in the shot are remaining unchanged. While that's cool, this is kind of exposing some problems with our selection. So we'll go back to our qualifier and touch it up. Looks like I just needed to bring the saturation a little further down into the low end and it really cleaned up those edges. Another really cool thing Resolve can do is export alpha channels. If you want to learn how to do that, check out this video I made to show you how it's done. I'll see you over there.